This video is brought to you by Apis Tactical. Apis Tactical is bringing a new light to the beekeeping protective gear. They started with a robust nice looking glove that I enjoy very much and in the future they're bringing a lot of new surprises for everybody. Please check them out, link in the description of this video. We all know that honeybees, apes mellifera, are suffering from a nasty infestation caused by a dangerous pest called varroa mite. This mite is spread all over the globe now with the recent introduction to Australia. We also recently learned that neonectinoids help varroa mites to thrive while simultaneously dismantling virtually all surviving mechanisms honeybees developed throughout their natural history, from the immune system to cognitive complications. Many beekeepers and companies are looking for solutions for this devastating pest, and we have covered several of them in recent videos. On the natural side, researchers are trying to learn from populations of honeybees that naturally adapt to this mite. Dr. Melissa Odi, a honeybee researcher whom I interviewed on this channel, identified and studied an interesting population of honeybees in Norway that naturally adapt against the infestation of varroa mites. For some mysterious reason, varroa mites cannot reproduce in these bees as well as in managed honeybee colonies from the same region. What's going on in these colonies? How do the bees handle varroa infestation by themselves? We learned in that interview about an interesting new behavior observed in these naturally adapted honeybees, something called brood cell recapping. Apparently bees perform a special hygienic behavior linked to mite infestation. These bees are somehow able to identify, perhaps by smell, honeybee brood infested by varroa mites. When they open the brood cells for inspection, they end up disrupting the reproductive cycle of the varroa mites inside that cell. In another study, Dr. Audi investigated whether virus infections from these mite-adapted honeybee colonies could be involved as well. For example, these honeybees might also be more tolerant to the viruses varroa mites transmit, which could be another explanation for the resistance to varroa itself. Remember, most of the damage caused by varroa mites come from the viruses they transmit, rather than their feeding on the fat bodies and hemolymph itself. Before we jump into Dr. Audi's observations, I just want to tell those interested in Dr. Audi's work that she's writing a book about varroa mite resistant bees called Resisting Varroa, where she will educate all of us about the secrets of this new and fascinating area of knowledge so we can use it in beekeeping operations all over the world. Please check the link in the description to know more about this interesting project. First, Dr. Audi looked at varroa mite infestations of these honeybee colonies. As expected, she found that naturally adapted colonies had far fewer mites than managed colonies during spring, summer and autumn. This demonstrates a smart research methodology. Sometimes people assume colonies are naturally resistant to varroa mites without verifying it. With this confirmation, Dr. Audi could proceed with confidence. Next, she investigated viruses' prevalence and abundance. In other words, what type of viruses and what quantities they appear in these naturally varroa-resistant honeybee colonies. That is an important measure. If colonies naturally resistant to varroa mites show different types and amounts of viruses compared to susceptible colonies, this could suggest they've developed a resistance not only to the mites themselves, but also to the viruses that they transmit. The surviving colonies had a significantly lower prevalence of the formal wing virus A, but higher prevalence of black queen cell virus than susceptible colonies from the same region. Interestingly, no other single virus from the list showed significantly different rates between the two population types. Regarding the abundance of each virus studied here, while the surviving colonies had higher black queen cell virus load, no difference among the other tested virus was observed, including the former wing virus A. So what's going on here? In a honeybee colony resistant to varroa mites that apparently does not allow varroa to replicate as easily as normal, it is reasonable to expect lower virus detection. The logic is simple. Fewer varroa transmitting the viruses mean fewer viruses that will be found in these colonies. But that's not entirely the case here. As we could see, the formula wing virus, 
followed that pattern. There was less deformed queen virus in surviving colonies, but there were also more black queen cell virus in those colonies. It is good to note that the formal queen virus is a virus transmitted by varroa, while black queen cell virus, as far as we know, is not transmitted by varroa. The authors mentioned something interesting, and I quote, The data therefore suggests that general adaptations to virus infection, though still possible, are unlikely to explain colony survival. Instead, mechanisms suppressing mite reproduction and therefore reducing vector presence seems to be more important. What does all that mean to beekeeper? Are surviving colonies more susceptible to viruses not transmitted by varroa? Is this good or bad for the whole annual life cycle of the honeybees? I am not sure what to think about these results. These and many other questions are still in the air right now, and that's why I invited Dr. Audi one more time for a live stream so we can all discuss her work on surviving colonies and also her new book about varroa-resistant honeybees. The live stream is scheduled for March 13 at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Please register to the event using the link in the description so you can be notified about updates. Thanks for watching. Inside the Hype.tv, the show about beasts. See you guys in the next video.